Number 5. Grigory Rasputin Grigory Rasputin, the mad monk of Russia, was a mystical healer who wandered Russia in the early 20th century. Now I could do a plot summary of what Rasputin got up to, but honestly Boney M did a better job than I ever will, so just all tab out of this video real quick, listen to that song, come on back. Okay. Did you? Well if you didn't, the quick rundown is that the black monk genuinely believed himself to be a holy healer with otherworldly powers, and was appointed a lofty position by Tsarina Alexandra to heal the young prince of his hemophilia. He was rumored to be part of a secret order called Klisti, connected with all sorts of scandalous practices. Now, No official connection was ever made to Rasputin and the sect, rumors of the man still persisted. He carried an infamous reputation around the country, with stories of his wild debauchery and black magic, stories of wild powers. Did he really? have otherworldly powers? Given his infamous nigh immortality, I am a bit inclined to agree with him. The man simply could not be put down without serious effort. There was a plot to have him enticed by a courtesan and castrated until he caught wind of it. In 1914, he was in the chest by a beggar and shrugged it off like it was nothing. Now, of course, the most famous story of Rasputin was his assassination at the hands of the Tsar's cousin and a handful of noblemen. As the famous legend goes, he was poisoned, bludgeoned and drowned, and still that wasn't enough until he passed later in the day. Was Rasputin just Russia's toughest customer, built different, or did he have some sort of mystical help from another world? We may never know. Hey, are we having fun with the channel, my little freaks and creeps? Stay subscribed for more scary content every single day. Number 4. Vlad the Impaler you know, with a title like Vlad the Impaler, it's safe to assume that the guy was probably up to no good, demon or no demon. Perhaps you've heard the legend that Vlad Tepes was the inspiration for Count Dracula, which should tell you even more if you want to judge of this guy's moral character. Vlad was a prince of Wallachia, an area that's now known as modern Romania. Vlad grew up in a very dark period of Wallachian history, coming up while the Ottoman Empire was setting its sights on just about everything good in Eastern Europe. Vlad was made king of Wallachia, but first he was deposed and exiled after an assassination plot on his brother and father. He would reclaim the throne in 1458 and quickly began a campaign of bloodlust to show the world he was not someone you should be messing with. One of his most infamous acts, and where the dubious title comes from, was after fending off an Ottoman invasion, he impaled 20,000 soldiers and left them as a grim forest of the damned. And some legends say he would eat dinner in front of this. Downright demonic behavior. There's some debate as to whether or not he really is the inspiration for Dracula, although of note is that Beside his infamous sobriquet Vlad the Impaler, he went by the nickname Vlad Dracul, owning from his father's position in the Order of the Dragon, which translated to Dracul. There are also stories of Vlad washing his hands with the blood of his enemies, which I'm gonna be honest, that kinda sounds like something Dracula would do. It's worth noting too, no one really knows what happened to Vlad's body. We know that he was slain in battle, and that he was eventually put down after years of carnage, but his body or grave has never been found. Perhaps it's because it's still walking or flapping, whatever a bat does. Number 3. Jack the Ripper Jack the Ripper is one of history's most infamous criminals, and honestly, maybe the most. Over 130 years ago, and we are still absolutely fascinated by his crimes, and we still don't even know for certain who he was. Could still be out there, he could still be at large. He terrorized Whitechapel through the year of 1888, leaving behind a series of sickeningly grisly crime scenes, torn apart and left in the street for all to see. There are at least five confirmed cases that are attributed to Jack the Ripper, but there are several more that are speculated to be attached to him, with some suggesting that it could be anywhere from 13 or higher. Jack eluded capture, stupefied his pursuers, and taunted his would-be captors, sending the police souvenirs, I guess, from his crimes, wrapping in the mail and sending them out. On one occasion, he did this alongside a threatening letter, boldly claiming to be from hell, known as the from hell letter. The jeering letter taunted the police, inviting them to catch him, while he described the pleasure he took in his sick, sordid dealings. Investigators were downright stumped trying to find the guy. They suspected he didn't have any level of medical training, as his hurried slashes led them to believe he could have been a butcher. The way he slashed his victims was beyond horrific. He left them missing, missing and in some cases beyond recognition. It seemed too like he could be in multiple places at once. A body discovered in New York a few years after the crime spree matched the victims of Whitechapel almost perfectly. Was it a human performing all these sickening acts? Or could the Ripper's mangling be attributed to a demon that was preying on the women of White Castle? It would explain how he was so elusive and managed to evade capture for all those years. Number 2. Emperor Nero Now perhaps you've heard of Emperor Nero. You've probably heard the story of him playing the fiddle as Rome burned around him. But 
Honestly, historically, that barely even cracks the top five craziest things Nero ever accomplished in his tenure as emperor. Nero set a new standard for wildness as a world leader that I think has never been matched again. Where do I begin with him? Let's start off small. He had a dedicated legion of soldiers, referred to as the Augustans, whose sole function was to follow him around and clap and hype him up whenever he would perform. Now that's kind of harmlessly crazy. So what about the story that Nero used to use his enemies as torches for his gardens? Yeah. Nero had a passionate hatred for Christians, blaming them for the infamous fire that engulfed Rome, which some historians believe Nero himself started. That's pretty wild. But what about the fact that Nero would dress himself in the skins of animals with his romantic partners? Or about how he orchestrated the deaths of his mother and brother? Nero ensured his own position as Emperor of Rome. Emperor Claudius married Nero's mother Agrippina, who then adopted Nero as his own son. When Agrippina poisoned Claudius, Nero took the throne, and then to ensure that he could keep that position on that lofty chair, he poisoned his stepbrother and would later poison his own mother to make sure no one could challenge him as emperor. He then enjoyed all the pleasures of Rome as much as he could. He depleted the treasury of Rome at one point solely to make a statue of himself in his own honor, the Colossus of Nero, to leave a lasting legacy. In the end, after years of insanity, Nero took his own life by ordering one of his own servants to stab him after being told he would be executed by the state as he was considered an enemy of Rome. He bemoaned what an artist the world was losing. Nero's proclivity for wild debauchery, outrageous Outrageous pursuits of pleasure, intense want and cruelty, and violence towards Christians led some people at the time to view Nero as the Antichrist himself. And to be honest, I get it. Number one, Manson. Charles Manson. The most infamous cult leader in history. And he might very well be one of the most famous criminals of all time. Charles Manson had a hypnotic level of control over his devout followers, leading them to a dark crime spree that would claim the lives of 35 people. Now, Manson himself never raised raised a blade to anyone that we know of, but rather used his domineering charisma to orchestrate the slayings down to the littlest details. He had a grim vision of an apocalypse where he believed there was going to be a race war and that his family needed to prepare for this. And part of these preparations was bumping off key celebrities he had a list of. Manson had dominion over his followers, giving them sacrament every day when in reality he was just giving them illegal substances to keep them impressionable. He banned glasses, calendars, watches, clocks, and anything that would grant them to the real world and made them more malleable to his will. Now, Manson and his family are host to a number of conspiracy theories. There's a very popular one saying that Manson himself is a product of the CIA's MK Ultra brainwashing program, and this is why he was so effective at controlling other people, and that the whole Manson family cult was a CIA op to destabilize the hippie movement. But another very prevailing theory is that the Manson family were Satanists, and they were part of a nationwide cabal connected with other dark crimes around the same time, like the Son of Sam. Manson's obsession with Evil, his dark dealings, and complete control over his subjects do make him seem a bit like a modern day Lucifer. Could Manson have had a supernatural level of control over people? Kicking this list off, we have Frankenstein. Okay, not really the Dr. Frankenstein that we know and love, but the man who Mary Shelley based the novel off of, and around. Well, one of them at least. Mad scientists are still puzzled by the works of one Johann Conrad Dippel. Dippel was born at Castle Frankenstein in Germany, where he would attend the university as a philosopher. He studied theology, philosophy, and alchemy at the University of Gizen, obtaining a master's degree in 1693. In the 1700s, he then turned to hermetic studies and alchemy, and this is where it gets a little mad scientist-y. There are claims that during his experiments at Castle Frankenstein, he practiced alchemy and anatomy at the same time, on both the living and the deceased. Yeah. Creepy. Dippel even said that the rumors were true that he had sold his soul to the devil in exchange for secret knowledge. Yeah, that'll do it. He had a huge reputation surrounding dark sorcery, specifically for his work around the Philosopher's Stone and his claim to fame, the Elixir of Life. He performed experiments with cadavers and attempted to transfer the soul of one to another. Yeah, he was obsessed with this idea of soul transference with barely and freshly dead people. Common experiments among alchemists at the time though. One night apparently while he was working with nitroglycerin and the effect on magnetism and electricity apparently led to the destruction and a huge explosion at Castle Frankenstein. It was this night that he apparently was messing around with lightning and the answer to all his ailments came to him. 
Hmm. Local mythology and lore recounts huge explosions and lightning emitted from the castle that night. I guess this was a pretty infamous night. It seems like it's right out of the book, no? Apparently this was the night he acquired the knowledge behind creating the elixir of life. His pride and joy. So what exactly happened that night at Castle Frankenstein? Huge lightning storm? Or was this guy opening portals looking for souls? You tell me. Number four, Electro. Okay, they were definitely onto something back then. Lots of magnets and souls and electricity going on. It's 1803. Giovanni Aldini was an Italian physician and physicist born in Bologna, Italy. He, just like the other Dr. Frankenstein, liked to conduct high amounts of electricity through corpses to see what they could do. Yeah, sinister stuff. But science, you know? They like to do these crazy experiments and then write it down and stuff. Lab coats, you know. I have a weak stomach, I could never have sat through these experiments. Since electricity was relatively new at the time, all these zany ideas from these mad scientists multiplied the more playing around with it. Soon, it became otherworldly. The obsession around electricity, magnets, souls, other realms, they were hypothesizing leading to some pretty evil stuff. In 1803, the fresh body of a murderer was pulled down from the gallows of Newgate Prison in London and taken to the Royal College of Surgeons for experimenting. There, before an audience of doctors and physicists, Giovanni attempted to breach realms and return the corpse from beyond the grave. Ooh, okay. Homemade batteries and magnets was used, which made the deceased muscles contort aggressively and apparently his eyes even opened, looking around the room. Giovanni then stuck the rod where the sun don't shine, then made the whole body start to move about as if it had come to life. For years, he was the leading scientist in electricity and its effect on the body. Apparently some claim that Aldini would even experiment on himself, pushing the limits and dialing up the voltage. Dude, this guy's Electro from Spider-Man. In recognition of his merits, the Emperor of Austria made him a Knight of the Iron Crown and died not many years later. And although he was unsuccessful at bringing souls back from the dead using electricity, I'm I'm sure this guy experienced more than he shared. I wonder who has his journal. Number three, no, I'm Spartacus. Actually, much, much more evil than him. Heinrich Mueller, born in Munich, Germany, April 1900. After serving as a pilot in World War I, he joined the police in Munich, soon acquiring a reputation as a skilled investigator. As such, he would draw the attention of two nastier men, Heinrich H. and Reinhard H., leaders of the German SS Army. Yeah, I don't even like saying their full names out loud. Just Google them up. You'll know. Mueller entered the SS in 1934 and quickly rose through the ranks of the organization as a police official. In 1939, when the Gestapo police force and the other organizations joined the Reich, Mueller was made head honcho. Yeah, basically this guy was like next in charge to you know who. He was a pretty scary and powerful guy. Mueller was involved in a ton of criminal affairs. He helped plan the Polish attack, he signed the bullet order. He authorized the torture of officers who had conspired to kill other SS soldiers. People knew him and knew of him. He was, unfortunately, infamous and a huge deal. This is the weird part. When the Allies moved in and they arrested him, the man turned out to be another Mueller. Okay. In fact, they couldn't find THE Heinrich Mueller, instead arresting many others of the same name. The head of the Gestapo wanted for crimes against humanity had vanished without even a trace. Gone. Even the CIA were like, okay, where the hell did this guy just go? He was just right here. He apparently vanished in the last days of the war. The Western Secret Services started many investigations over the years, but Mueller and the vast majority of the Gestapo secret files were never found. In 2001, the CIA reopened its archives about the SS war criminal and revealed it still knew nothing new or conclusive about the SS Heinrich Mueller who had been in charge all those years ago. Where did this guy vanish to? I don't know. Number two, us. Sure, I've had my fair share of sibling rivalry. One's better at this, one's better at that. But these siblings took it to a whole other realm. The Han twins, or as I like to call it, the story of good versus evil. A tale as old as time. Well, not that long ago, actually. During the 90s, this was a huge case plastered on every screen of the attempted murder of Sunny Han by her identical twin sister, Gina Han. Whoa. It's November 6, 1996 in California. It quickly became a jaw-dropping case in the media as the case touched on themes of broken families, sister rivalry, split personas, and of course, parallel universes. The sisters had always had disagreements, but apparently hatred became obsession. Throwing some hands here and there became stalking, and eventually jail time. The older they got, the more things escalated. Gina, after escaping prison, had drummed up the idea to hire two teenagers to kidnap her sister. 
Uh oh. During the kidnapping, the plan, however, failed, and the two men were quickly taken into custody by police. Just before going to Sonny's apartment, they went to buy large garbage bags, duct tape, wine, gloves, pine sole cleaner, and magazines. Yeah. The police were notified and luckily reached them before Sonny's evil plan could commence. And it was a clo oh. and it was a close one. They, including the evil sister, were locked and loaded. Literally. Scary. Yeah, as in she literally dodged a bullet on that one. This is like the metal Mario version of yourself, isn't it? This is terrifying. Do you even think you could take an evil version of yourself? It's sad that it's family, you know? The jury reached their verdict as to each defendant on November 20th, 1997, and Han was convicted of all charges, which were one count of conspiracy to commit murder, two counts of burglary, two counts of false imprisonment, and one count of possession of a weapon. So why did she hate her sister so much? How come she wanted to take over her life and just live one. This has evil parallel universe written all over it, dude. And number one, the gods. Peru contains its fair share of ancient megalithic ruins. I'll do it again, sorry. Peru contains its fair share of ancient megalithic ruins. If you're not familiar with the construction of myths behind the Machu Picchu and the Nazca lines, then this next one may make you scratch your head. Some would say those are cute compared to this next rock. I don't know. The door in Hayumarca, some think it's a wall, but most believe it becomes a portal to the beyond. The story of the Gate of the Gods, also known as Door of Hayumarca, begins near the banks of the Titica over half a millennium ago. According to Incan legend, the universe began here and according to researchers, the Incan Empire fell here, somewhere around 1592. Peruvians tell the tale of an Incan priest who barely escaped slaughter from the conquistador forces. His name was Aramu Muru, and he was a powerful high priest who served in the Temple of the Seven Rays. To escape his imminent death at the hands of the Spanish army, Muru fled to Heumarca with the help of other priests, and using a golden disc key, Muru opened the small door in the face of the rock, apparently venturing into another realm. According to legend, the stone door transformed into a bright tunnel that was lit with an unearthly blue light. Aramu Muru passed through the barrier and entered the void upon which the door then closed behind him. Spooky. Many people believe that he is now living in the land of the gods. Many still believe he is to return with the knowledge of the other side. I mean, if this guy just like platform nine and three quartered himself through a perfectly sanded rock face, yeah, I'm gonna say it's ancient aliens. Right away, 100%. This site's also been said to be aligned by five other archeological sites which together form an imaginary cross with straight lines crossing each other exactly at the point where this plateau and lake are located. That makes it even creepier. Coming in at number five, we've got Yaldabaoth. This one's a super big Persona 5 spoiler, so if you haven't played it yet or are still waiting for the Switch version, sorry, maybe skip to the next number. The Holy Grail, the God of Control, the fake Igor. This is the absolute biggest bad in Persona of five. After the Phantom Thieves defeat all of the other more publicly menacing enemies and assume it'll be smooth sailing to the end, this guy shows up to ruin everything. And he totally does ruin everything. As the manifestation of humanity's wish for order and control, this mecha angel can control people's desires and their cognition of the world around them. He considers himself a god above all other beings. Talk about a superiority complex. As such, he is also representative of the seven deadly sins. Lust, gluttony, greed, Greed, sloth, wrath, envy, pride, you name it. He has the power to destroy the world through a hard reset of everything or by enslaving humanity through a false reality. Although he didn't begin with all that power, Yaldabaoth holds the human world in the palm of his hand and is made more powerful by the will of humans as a whole. The more people that wish for a strong leader and to be told what to do, the more mighty he becomes. Upon gaining sentience, he saw how corrupt society was and decided that humans should be met with ruin. This is a little bit paradoxical though because he does have the ability to influence the will of the public. As such, he could steer them in a better direction, but instead allows them to continue on the same path in order to ensure his rule over the world. All this power makes him arrogant, believing that he is truly the ultimate being. That kind of arrogance makes me suspect that he would destroy the whole world on a whim. And he would have got away with it too if it weren't for those meddling thieves. Number four, Beelzebub. No, not Beelzebub, boss. This demon isn't quite as sick nasty on the drums. 
However, he is the demon of gluttony, the devil of pride, the false god. He's one of the three most prominent and powerful of the fallen angels alongside Satan and Leviathan. This guy sits atop hell's hierarchy like it's nothing. Known for causing jealous murders and inciting wars, this is another demon who loves to watch the world burn. His aim is to cover the world with terror and corruption. And that's not too hard for a demon with dominion over decay and decomposition. You'll know it's him by the swarms of flies that surround him, or if he decides to transform into a giant hideous fly himself. And unlike Seth Brundle, Beelzebub can change back into his human form, no problems. These flies can even carry souls into the abyss. There are a few ways this fiery fly fellow might end the world. One would be raising an army of chaos at the drop of a hat. Yeah. That would be bad. Although, if I know anything about demons, I would say he might try some other stuff first. As a demon of gluttony, it's likely that his plans are already in effect. He could be very well influencing powerful humans, getting them to encourage overconsumption across the board. Why else would we be eating fast food and throwing away unused groceries when there are starving people out there? What other reason could there be behind the insane burning of fossil fuels and the constant purchasing of plastic gadgets that we don't need? It's Beelzebub trying to make us hollow out our planet. It's gotta be. If it's up to him, we won't go out with a bang, but with a whimper. Coming in at number 3, we've got Xenobites. Speaking of bangs and whimpers, if these terrifying extra dimensional torture play demons take over, we'll be doing a lot of both. Hailing from Clive Barker's extended universes, the Xenobites have collective power unlike any other. To quote Pinhead himself, they are explorers in the further regions of experience. Demons to some, angels to others. Clad in leather, with lots of open wounds to boot, these BDSM loving aliens can only come to earth through schisms in time and space, opened by unearthly artifacts. When summoned, they are known to subject their victims to emotional and psychological torture far beyond what any human could have previously imagined. With a variety of powers, this is no big deal to the Cenobites. Hooks and chains that can be summoned from any shadow to rip and tear at the flesh of those under their influence, telekinetic powers, and otherworldly strength are are just a few of the many ways they can drive humans mad with pain and pleasure. The pain is obviously being delivered in much higher quantities. As detailed in Hellraiser 2, they actually live in another maze-like dimension and they bring their quarry into this labyrinth for unimaginable torture. There are also beastly abominations dwelling in this dimension that could be released into the human world looking for some flesh to consume. Horrible monstrosities aren't well known for their self-regulation either. The Cenobites don't seem too concerned with destroying the planet in early iterations of the Hellraiser series, but starting in Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth, it seems like some can break free of whatever was limiting that urge before. Pinhead acts on his own, flying in the face of previous Cenobite behavior, and uses his powers to cause all sorts of pain and destruction. This implies that other Cenobites have the capacity to do the same, which could spell out major calamity on Earth if they all choose to hop over one dimension en masse. Y'all better get ready for some intense pain and pleasure or you're in for a bad time. They have such sights to show us. Filling out our number two spot, we've got the Icon of Sin. Somebody called Doom Guy, we need a little help. The final boss in Doom 2, Hell on Earth, this Baphomet headed demon spawner could end our world in a heartbeat. In fact, it already did in Doom 2. Just because it was killed in the end doesn't mean the world isn't still blasted to smithereens. There's no taking back that kind of worldwide collapse. The Earth is already ruined by the time our heroic space marine shows up to kick ass and chew bubblegum. Wait, no, that's the wrong FPS. Getting back to how this giant robo devil would destroy the world, it literally infinitely spawns demons from hell into our world. How does it do this? Well, in the Doom universe, humans have come up with some pretty ingenious teleportation technology. However, as teleportation tech is apt to do, it malfunctions and opens a portal to hell on Mars. We are led to believe that this problem only exists on Mars in the first game, but that would be too convenient, wouldn't it? In Doom 2, more portals open on Earth and the Icon of Sin gets to chill in the bowels of hell and fire demon after demon through these portals to cause humans a whole lot of trouble. And if we're being real, nobody on Earth even comes close to the demon slaying capabilities of the fictional Doom guy. So if these portals open, and if this metal-headed brain demon decides to spawn a bunch of hellions in the city streets, it's all over. And filling out our number one spot, we have the Saint of Killers from Preacher. Of all the demons on this list, only one has successfully killed both Satan 
and God. Yes, I did say a demon killed God. That deity ending demon is the saint of killers from Preacher. Once a bloodthirsty confederate soldier known as the Butcher of Gettysburg, the saint of killers decided to settle down with a woman and find peace. Still a man at this point, he fell in love, had a family, and was happy. Sadly, he lived in a time where medicine was scarce and happy endings even scarcer. Disease took its toll and his family died when he was out looking for a cure. Upon finding their corpses, the last sliver of good inside him disappeared and he became a force of pure hatred. He walked through the town of Ratwater and slaughtered every single citizen. Upon emptying out the local saloon, he took a shot and was killed by a tornado. His hate did not max out there though. No way. Instead, he was damned to hell and forced to relive his family's death over and over. Each time, he also lived through his slaughter of the Ratwater populace. Soon enough, he's sprung from hell to seek out and kill Jesse Custer, and well, the rest is history. Immortal and on a bloody quest for revenge against the world, the Saint of Killers is a killing machine. I mean, you probably got that bit from his name. His guns, a pair of Colt 1847 walkers, were gifted to him by the Angel of Death. They never run out of ammunition, they never jam, and they are omni-deadly. That means they will not miss their target and one shot will always kill, regardless of circumstance. It's like aimbot in real life. Can't kick this guy from the lobby. The guns can penetrate a dozen walls and actually drill a hole from one end of the earth to the other. Plus, he retains them even after dying, which coincidentally is how he kills God. So now he's up in heaven ruling over paradise. And if he chose to do so, he could kill every last person on earth without breaking a sweat. And knowing the amount of hatred deep in his heart, he probably would without a second thought. <laughs>